Uh, welcome and uh, good evening everyone to this uh, last webinar of the year about the uh, organized by the FIB Young Members Group. And this event of uh, today is about the potentiality for structural innovation and overlook perspective. Um, I'm Marta de Zoppo from the Young Members Group Board, and the speaker of today is Dr. Leonardo Todisco from the uh, Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. Uh, but before starting, uh, just a few um, quick information about the webinar. So uh, this webinar is uh, recorded, so um, the video will be shared on the FIB social channels and uh, on YouTube. Uh, only the panelists are able to speak during the webinar and uh, you can use um, the chat function to um, interact with us. Uh, in the chat, you can post your general feedback about the uh, webinar or comments, uh, but please use the Q&A form that is at the bottom of your screen uh, to, for the quest technical question to the speaker. And we will answer to all the questions at the end of the webinar during the Q&A session. And now I leave the floor to uh, the FID President, Rolle Olsen, and the FID General Secretary, uh, Secretary uh, David Fernandez Zordonia. Please. Well, hello. Um, I, will, I will just say some, a couple of words before um, talking uh, to Rolle, who is our president. I, I just want to say that this uh, series of webinars from the Young Members Group has uh, really been a success. This is the last one of the year, and we will continue next year. And uh, as Marta has said, uh, please don't forget uh, that you have the videos, so you will have the videos in the YouTube channel, and you can subscribe to that channel or to our social media to reach, uh, to reach the information that is uh, coming from that. I think it's uh, very interesting how the young members group have uh, developed, and, and they are doing a great work to to let people uh, talk and, and allow people to, to see what uh, everybody is, is doing in the structural concrete. I just want to say that uh, we have uh, just finishing a program now that uh, for awards for outstanding engineers uh, that will be given in the next symposium in, um, in Lisbon in 21. And we have a lot of very good submissions. And so those, those are very good awards for young engineers. And also in every event, we give the award for the best uh, paper for young people. We ha also have uh, created uh, some programs to, to help uh, and uh, we think that uh, we would like to also to create and to formalize more uh, courses, specialized courses uh, online or hopefully in person in the future also regarding all this. So please don't forget to see our YouTube channel and your website if you want to be connected to us. And uh, saying that, I will uh, let uh, Torole also our president to, to talk. Thank you, Marta and uh, David. First of all, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me. Uh, it's nice for me. I, I like the YMG very much. Uh, just a little reminder about um, the size of the FIB. Uh, just a second, I will we'll put it in presentation. Uh, FIB has a, a mission and uh, the number of uh, uh, countries that are a member of FIB uh, covers the, the, almost all over the world. So uh, success of FIB is important. Uh, these are the members. Now, you know approximately how FIB works maybe uh, for this uh, event. Uh, we have the YMG, and uh, everyone in FIB are, is imp impressed by the, uh, the vitality and the things that you produce, webinars and other things. And I also had the opportunity to be with you in Prague a couple of years back, 
And uh, I took the photo, so I'm not on the photo, <laughs> but you are, some of you. Uh, this is uh, Helga. Uh, she saw a bowl of fruit and uh, she knew that there were some leftover wine from the opening party. And in about two minutes, she, she got the permission to change that bowl of fruit to a bowl of wine and fruit. And this is not the main purpose of the YMG, I understand that, but it makes a difference. Uh, if you consider the old member groups of FIB, this would never have happened. So this is a, uh, a flower for FIB, I think, and it makes it more pleasant to be part of FIB. Uh, one new thing this year is that we have developed something we call a mentoring program. And this is something that you may want to look into if you are interested. Uh, I'll just say a few words about upcoming events. Uh, David mentioned the symposium in, in Lisbon in June. Uh, the, uh, the PhD uh, symposium in Paris, and because the uh, PhD candidates have to participate before they receive the degrees, uh, the courtesy uh, of the French organizers was to split to make those that had to participate this year a webinar, and those that uh, don't have to finish this year, they are giving the opportunity to meet next year. And to not disturb the, 20, uh, the, uh, the next one in 22 in Italy, uh, it is only those participating for the 20 uh, PhD symposium that comes for the 2021st. And then we have a postponed uh, ICCS 20 in 21. We have a, a FIP conceptual design solution, a, a, a symposium, I mean. Uh, this is now a bi yearly event, like the PhD symposia, and in Switzerland in 2021, in Oslo in 2023. And then, of course, we have the uh, Congress in Oslo in 2022. So thank you very much and best of luck to all of you and also to you presenter. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for your presence and for your words. And I would just to add, uh, if some of you uh, um, of the audience want to uh, learn more, know more about the members group, you can contact us uh, by means of our um, social channels on Facebook and also uh, on the um, uh, FAB official website. There is a session where, uh, about the members group where you can apply or ask for information about the group. And now I want also to add that the participation to this webinar is completely free of charge. Uh, but if you need a certificate of attendance, you can uh, write to this email publication at fibinternational.org. Um, uh, the cost of the certificate can be um, requested only for people who attend up to 60% of the, of the webinar. Now, I hope you can hear me. Um, it's time to introduce, introduce our speaker of today. Um, Dr. Leonardo Tedisco is an uh, assistant professor in structural engineering at the Universidad Politecnica de Madrid. Uh, he's done also research abroad at uh, ILEC and MIT, has been awarded the IASS Hangai Prize, and is currently the president of the Young Members Group, uh, the FIB Young Members Group in, in Spain, the Spanish Association for Structural Engineering. 
um, as his teaching and research and interest uh, is to investigate new relationship between uh, architectural shape and structural performance for the design of innovative structural systems for buildings and bridges. So now I leave the floor to you, Leonardo. Please uh, share your presentation and enjoy the work, the webinar. Marta, thank you very much for your very kind presentation and thanks a lot for inviting me this night. Well, <clears throat> today uh, I, will f I will speak a little bit about the great impact, in my opinion, of course, that post-tensioning may have on the design of structure. So I will present three different topics very briefly. The first one is post-tensioning measure structures, and this research claims the high potential of masonry has a primary load-bearing material, especially when combined with post-tensioning. Then I will move to my PhD thesis, which is post-tensioning freeform structures. And this research illustrates how external post-tensioning can convert any geometry into a bending free one. So this opens up new possibilities for design that combine material efficient solution with architectural freedom. And finally, I will jump to the third topic, which is about potential responsive structures. And this research presents the possibility of using responsive external potential system where the responsive behavior is materialized through an actuator between the, the, the beam and the potential system. So let's start with the first one. For each topic, I will show who are the people involved in each research. And in this case, the main author is our PhD candidate, Elizabeth Stocks, together with myself and Javier Leon, which is, who is another professor at our university. So this is a very simple interaction diagram for a dry stone masonry structure. So please note that for very low values of axial forces, the bending that the structure can support is very low. And this is because the material has no tensile strength. So point one, this one here is a safe point because we are inside the interaction diagram. But if we slight increase the bending moment, it moves to point two, this one, and the structure is not safe. So it will collapse. Now, if we increase the axial forces, for example, through pre-stress, we move horizontally to point three and discover that the structure, yes, is able to cope with very high bending moment, regardless of zero tensile strength. So the key idea here is to provide additional strength capacity through post-tensioning. And this would result in a more slender structure, especially if compared with a standard masonry structure, increased instability, lack, this is very important, of creep and shrinkage effects. In fact, for example, stone has no rheological effects and therefore there are no losses of pre-stress. Higher seismic performance without increasing the structural mass. High durability because there are no passive reinforcement, reinforcement bars, and the post tension can be well very protected and be unbounded, it can be replaced. Then sustainability, because the stone is a natural material, so it does not require any chemical process, and therefore the, it's a lower, uh, it, its embodied energy is lower compared to other construction material. And finally, reuse, because the stone can be reused for other projects. So despite the evident, I will say, advantage of combining masonry with pre-stress, their joint use has been poorly exploited. Here we have some examples of buildings, for example, this one, which is the Queen's Buildings in Cambridge, where the columns are post-tension, the very famous Sagrada Familia in, in Barcelona, which is still in construction, and here the Padre Pio Church in San Giovanni Rotondo, close to, in Italy, close to the city where I was born, where the post-tension goes inside the structure. 
Then we have other application to bridges, for example, mostly footbridge, as in this case, we have this bridge in Japan. We have several a series of pre-stressed granite footbridge in Germany. And then we have this example by Schleichen Partner, where we have a tree-like mast composed by individual blocks of natural gabbro. So more recently, um, there are other examples of helical stone stairs built around the world by, by the same company. And in all cases, the constantion goes inside the structure, therefore is invisible from outside. So I ask, may we apply this concept to design stone arch footbridge with an internal post-tensioning system? Well, this is a very simple arch. This is graphic statics, super famous, under self-weight. And the corresponding truss line, this blue one, is within the structural boundary. So the structure is safe. This is just for self-weight. But then if we had a point load here in red, the up the trust line, this one, is not contained within the structure. So it would require an arch with bigger dimension. But if we introduce a system of external equilibrated forces has the pre-stress, now the structures maintaining the original slenderness is able to contain perfectly the truss line associated to the self-weight, to pre-stress, and the point load here. So this plot shows the benefits of a post-tensioning masonry arch in terms of maximum load supported by the structures. So the horizontal axis here indicates the different level of axial stresses within the structures, with the structure, while the vertical axis here shows the maximum load that can be supported by the structure. The two colors correspond to, to two different load condition, the red line to a uniform distribution load on the first half of the bridge, while the blue one, it's a point load at one quarter of the bridge. And results show that, for example, if we increase the stress from 0.5, we should be here, to 2.5, we are here, we jump, the total load moves, increase from five, we will say, to 20 kilonewton. That means it just a small increase of compressive stress of just two MPA would increase the total supported load four times. And please consider that two MPA is a very low value of the compressive stress compared to the compressive strength of the material. So we got very good result from a very simple structure analysis and we decide to construct a scale Mesorish arch footbridge to assess the feasibility of the structural typology and somehow to validate the results. So our prototype has a span of five meters, as you can see here, a rise of 42 centimeters and a thickness of just six centimeters. That means that the span to thickness ratio is almost 80 and the span to rise ratio is 12. Here, the pre-stressing is provided by two seven millimeter wires that runs along the centroid of the arch. And two wires have been chosen due to the small width of the arch in order to avoid possible transversal backlink. In addition to this, two steel roads that you can see here and here have been added only to contain the horizontal thrust of the self-weight. It's important here to say that the post-tensioning does not change the horizontal reaction of the arch. So the first step consisted in designing the prototype. So we decided to use a circular arch for having uh, identical elements. Theoretically speaking, the, the circular arches, I know that is not the perfect antifunicular shape for a self-weight, but for a so shallow arch, the difference between catenary, parabola, and circular arch is absolutely unimportant.
And then the value of the pre-stress was defined to satisfy the ULS with a, live, with a live load according to the code of five kilonewton per square meters. And finally, we designed the support to ensure a proper transfer of forces and to minimize the centricity between the vertical reaction, the pre-stress and the horizontal tie. So the second step consists in stone cutting by a company called Quellier Stone, which is located in Almeria in the southern part of Spain. And the cut was done with a tolerance of around one millimeter. Then we assemble, we remove the scaffolding, and then we pre-stress with different values of forces and tested the footbridge at each step with asymmetrical and symmetrical loads. So the maximum pre-stressing force was 100 kilonewton, as you can see here, and this, co and this corresponds to a compressive stress of just 2.7 MPa. And now there is a very short video, one second, that show the whole process. These are the original pieces. This is the CNC machine used to cut all the pieces. Now this is very easy to do with our technologies. And in our specific case, all the elements are or are all identical. The weight of each block around 20 kilos. This has been done with a marble, but theoretically speaking, this can be done with any kind of stone. This is our lab where we create a framework. We did, we did this activity within our courses on masonry structures. These are the horizontal bars that we use only to restrain the horizontal displacement of the arch. We start from the springing, springings and move to the crown. This is the post tensioning wires, a couple seven millimeter wires, and this is the system that we have to develop with Dividag to put in tension to pre stress these elements. This is the removal of the centering. And finally, of course, we did uh, a lot of tests with several values of pre-stress and with load located in the center and at uh, one quarter. Here you can see a little bit the finished footbridge. And this is a very quick uh, time lapse during the construction. So this was our first load test just at the end of the construction, but it's important to say that we had to develop a system to pre-stress these elements that you can see here. And here we have a perspective of the system where the red elements are the pre-stressing wires. So the, the footbridge achieved a point load corresponded to 1.5 times the design load according to the code. In fact, the, 
these loads here correspond to 7.5 kilonewton per square meter, while the plot on the right shows the displacement of the arch versus the weight application. And when the pre-stress is higher, that means the, the line is darker, there is a clear reduction of vertical displacement. However, we found a problem that these values were higher than we expected. And the reason was the an incomplete surface contact among the different elements. And this is, is because the structure was assembled without any mortar or resin between the blocks and the geometrical imperfections increase when the structure is very slender as small as in this case. So to solve this problem, we study with SICA the application of different products as you can see here, in order to obtain a more uniform surface contact. And both uh, pictures show the application of different type of resin. We try several resins. And the use of resins, it, it was the only way to get a very thin joint thickness of around one millimeters. So the, the, the main goal of the bonding agent was just to provide a planar contact surface between blocks and therefore to ensure that the arch used the entire cross section to transfer the forces. Here we have two plots. On the left, the plot uh, without any resin, and the, on the right, the plot in, of the footbridge with the resin. So there is absolutely no comparison. In fact, due to the adhesive materials, the joints acquire some tensile capacity and no inch formation could be observed. So this explains the fact that the stiffness of the structures is independent on the right of the axial forces. And therefore, the vertical deflection are not related to the level of pre-stress has happened before. For a real scape prototype, I mean a big prototype, a real structure, probably we will we will use um, I would say cheap cement mortar or some aluminium metals between the blocks. So here is again an, a, a nice picture of the footbridge and. Uh, to conclude this first part, uh, I had to say that this prototype is going to be showed at the Footbridge Congress, which will be held in Madrid next year in September. So let's jump to the second part. This is basically my PhD thesis with some recent contribution and the the number of people that work it here is larger. It's myself, Hugo Corres from UPM, Caitlin Muir from MIT, Corentine Fiver from PFL, and Javier Cañada from Imperial College. So, and it is about post-tension freeform structure. This is the pavilion of the future, built for the Expo in 1992 in Seville. And this, uh, this work has strongly inspired my research. It is a project by Peter Rice when he worked at ARP. And this is a picture from outside the building and show that the facade, as you can see here, is made of, of uh, masonry elements, these ones, and not only support itself, but also support the roof, as you can see here. So the main concept takes advantage of the gravity load generated by the roof in order to apply an external load to the facade. If we get a little bit closer, we can see that the roof beams that we can see here and here are hanged to the facade through this system of cables that you can see here. So let's study this facade in, in, in more detail. So, <clears throat> If only the distribution self-weight is considered, the geometry chosen for the arch, the semicircle in this case, would collapse because the thrust line is not contained within the structural thickness of, of the facade. So aware of this problem, the designer modified the external loading of the arch with a series of radial struts tension by the weight of the roof. So now this changed the dominant loading and 
the semicircular arch was closer to be the antifunicular and the structure achieved stability. So my question is, so my proposal, better, my proposal is that we can use a similar approach, for example, for a very common problem, the design of a roof for a train station. One very efficient solution from a material point of view will be to use a catenary, which is the perfect antifunicular way, a geometry for the self-weight. However, there are a lot of situations in which non-structural condition, aesthetics, functionality, geotechnical issues make the selection of a pure funicular geometry difficult or impossible. So let's imagine that a basket arch has to be employed. This distribution of loads that we can see here, these are the loads that have to be applied into the structure in order to transform it into an antifunicular, an antifunicular structure. Of course, this is uh, impossible to think uh, ha has hanged weights because this would fill all of the space. So a more interesting possibly, possibility is based on the use of external post tensioning, which following a specific path is able to generate the required loads in each deviation point. The required loads, I repeat, are this one, and they can be generated by this external post tensioning system. So the use of post-tensioning technology uh, uh, is pretty recent and it has been applied mainly to, bridge, to bridges which are straight in elevation. So this is an example, it's a Zavalgana bridge in, Spain, in the north part of Spain, and this is a span of 60 meters. And here we have two pinned elements, as you can see here, this and this. Here we have a detail which connect the deck and the external post-tension equilibrating totally the permanent load of the bridge. So the application of the external forces really decrease the effective span of the bridge by introducing, we would like to say, uh, invisible columns at the center, as Eduardo Torroja, for example, did in the temple aqueduct. So the idea here is to employ the same technology, but not to structure straight in elevation, but to structure curve with any shape. Well, the theoretical framework uh, is based on graphic statics, which relate structural geometry and internal forces through reciprocal diagrams. We have a force polygon on the left, uh, a form of polygon, sorry, on the left, and a force polygon on the right. So this figure shows the final graphical construction of the methodology. And luckily we don't have enough time to see it step by step, but it has been published in my thesis and in other paper, et cetera. So basically the concept is that we have the main structure on the left and the force polygon on the right. So let's see in more detail. For example, this green ones, are the compressive elements. I mean, the, the elements that are working only in compression with no bending moments. And the axial force in this element can be obtained by measuring the distance between this point and this point. As you can see, this segment is parallel to this, as this segment here is parallel to this. So the, the measuring the segments in the force polygon, we can obtain the forces in the structure on the left. More, if we want to know the force in this element, we have to measure the length of this segment here. As you can see, this segment is parallel to this, this segment is parallel to this. And finally, we have the post-tensioning, which is the orange one, the dashed line, and the length, uh, uh, sorry, the force in this element can be measured as length of this segment. And it's important here to say that we have two horizontal reactions, H1 and H2. 
H1 is the horizontal reaction generated by the green arch, while H2 is the horizontal reaction generated by the post tensioning. So the graphical methods basically starts from a segmental discretization of the original geometry and the direction of the struts, well, connecting the main geometry and the external post tensioning. I say struts, but theoretically speaking, these elements, I mean, the blue one here can be compressed or tensioned. In this case, they are all compressed. So basically the method is divided in two main steps. The first step consists in defining a set of additional forces that have to be applied into the structure to close the polygon of forces and therefore to make the original geometry antifunicular. This step is governed by what we call the first indeterminacy of the problem. In fact, infinite load distribution can close this diagram. Therefore, the problem has infinite solution. And then the step two consists in defining the layout of the post tension to generate these forces. And this is what we call the second indeterminacy of the problem. And again, and again there are infinite layout of the post tension to generate the required forces. And this indeterminacy that maybe are a little bit to understand now because we don't have enough time, but they are very important to, uh, to evaluate the material efficiency of the structure as we will see later. So we, uh, before we mentioned that we have two horizontal uh, components of the reaction. And here, in order to better understand this fact, we can hal analyze half structure. And in this case, we have the pole of the graphical construction is here, and is here, and then is here. This means that the post tensioning here goes outside the structure, here cross the structure, and here goes inside the structure. And as you can see, the horizontal reaction is different. H1, uh, H2, sorry, he in this case has has to be summed to each one, the heating case is smaller. And in this case, there is no horizontal reaction net because H1 is exactly equal to H2, but with different direction. So to take advantage of the method for design purposes, we create a software called Exequilibrium, which can be downloaded for free. Just ask or send me an email or buy from our website. And the inputs are the starting geometry, the number subdivision, the direction of struct, and the existing load. And of course, we can explore the design space of a solution just playing with the first and the second indeterminacy. And then after performing graphical construction, we can get force, post tension geometry, reaction, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So here I will show a very short video where we can see the tool. On the left, we have Rhinoceros. On the right, we have Grasshopper. This is the first version of the software. It's a pretty old, but it works, I, I would say, well. Here we have, the first step is selecting the starting geometry. Here we have some pre-selected geometry or new ones can be added. For example, now there is a circular arch. Then we jump to a three-point arch. Then we have an art novel arch. And as you can see on the left, when you change the geometry, the main geometry, the graphical construction is up, uh, automatically updated. That means that automatically, automatically the structure is antifunicular. Then you can change the number subdivision, the direction of structs, or as in this case, you can play with the load, for example, here, as you can see, how the 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 the, for, the, set, the length of the segment change, then you can scale the force diagram. Here, you are not changing the reaction, but or the force, but they are just just for visually a little bit better. And finally, this is very important. You can explore all the design possibility playing with the first and the second indeterminacy. So this is very important for. Uh, try and explore the design space of solution. So, and the result is a structure like this, that it's very complicated to see, but it is 
working only in compression and this and this graphical construction it may appear very complicated but it isn't in fact for example now we know that the le the, the axial forces in this element is just the length of this segment as you can see this is parallel to this or this segment is parallel to this etc etc and again if you have a tool well you can solve uh, any kind of planar uh, geometry including very asymmetrical and very strange geometry like this one so all this shape are working only has a pure in pure compression so in order to visually show the importance of the external forces added to the structure, we 3D print a small model made of discrete elements. So the main structure, this one, is made of blocks, 3D printed, with no glue among them, of course. Then we have a wire, which somehow represent, I know this is not correct, but is a very small model, more for teaching purposes but it represents the post-tensioning. And then we have the connecting elements, this one, which are made of plastic. So here we can see, for example, that we have a circular a basket arch and it is perfect equilibrium. But when Francesca, my friend, cut the wire, the structure collapse. So this is a clear demonstration. It's a very it's a visual demonstration that if the arch has not a funicular shape for its self weight, it will collapse without the help of the external forces. And we did the same with other models, with uh, these asymmetrical models on the left and with the, the circular arch on the right. Well, all what we described until now has been applied to two dimensional structure. But recently, we studied a possible extension to three, to three dimensions. So on the left, we have just a node, no equilibrated in the space because we have three forces which are not equilibrated. So forcing acting on a node in graphic statics in 3D can be represented by faces perpendicular to the forces. And areas of these spaces are per, are um proportional to the magnitude of these forces so the force needed to achieve equilibrium of this node is just the phase that allow to close the polyhedron of forces this is a little bit complicated but basically is the same methodology and this cannot be applied to three-dimensional structure here we have on the left a tree structure where the the red arrows represented the permanent loads and the green are the forces that have to be applied on the structure to make it funicular. And on the right, we have the polyhedron of the compressive structure here. And then we have the polyhedron for the cable there, the cable system. Here a little bit complicated, but again, the methodology is all, almost the same, I will say. And we like physical model, so we 3D print other small model just for teaching purposes, but to show that again, these elements here, there is no glue, but are in equilibrium because of the external forces. So until now we have seen that the post tension is able to perfectly compensate dead load, permanent load better, big and, and to transform any geometry into pure compression shape. But what happened when other loads has a live load are applied. Well, we study a little bit this during the last two years. I don't have enough time to speak now, but to evaluate the behavior of the structure, any under, uh, under any load, permanent live loads, uh, I will just show one case of study. We selected the geometry of the third 30 meter span elliptical shape employed for the roof of the terminal QE of Charzago Airport, who collapsed a few years ago. So the main structure is this one, and it is a reinforced concrete frame with a rectangular cross section, and the governing load is um, wind load, which range from 5 to 10 kilonewton 
per, per meter. This is just an example. But the most important is that the standard solution, that means without any post tension, would require a concrete cross section of which with a depth of 1.8 meters. While if we had a post tension go, who, that goes outside the main extraction, the result shows a great reduction of the cross section. And we move from 1.8 here to 0.6 here. So the problem of this solution is that we increase a lot the horizontal reaction with this solution. Please note that here the, the vertical reaction increase from here to here decrease, sorry, just because the self weight of the structure is lower. So from my point of view, play with the first and the second indeterminacy that we saw a few minutes ago, the, this is the best alternatives. In fact, we have a very good results in terms of material cost. In fact, the, the depth of the structure is 75 centimeters. And considering the cost of struts, uh, main structure, and the post tension, we reduce the cost of the main structure of about 40%. And then in this case, and this is very important, we are reducing the horizontal forces, the horizontal reaction, sorry, about 60%. So the economic results has to be summed to a more slender and I would say visual elegant uh, structure. And now just jump to the third part of the topic, which is about post tension responsive structures, where again, the responsive behavior is materialized through an actuator located between the beam and the post tension system. In this case, the team is composed by myself, Marco Ral, who is a PhD candidate at the UPM, and Hugo Corres. So the plots, this plot that uh, uh, I, I was inspired by a similar plot that I found on the PhD thesis of Juni Lee, shows the number of times the word smart structures has been included in books published during the last uh, 60 years. So smart structure is a very general name. In fact, it includes kinetic, responsive, adaptive, active structure. But what is important to me is to point out that, that there is a clear trending shows an increasing interest in the topic. So when we start this, the, the, this research I had absolutely no idea of, the, of this word. And so the first we did, uh, to investigate the state of the art of the structure where the responsiveness or the adaptivity was related only to structural purposes. And this table here show a little bit, these drawings are done by us and show a little bit uh, which are all the studies and prototypes which are according our opinion important. And on the bottom, there is a legend where you can see the material, the sensor, and the actuators. And it is very interesting to see that adaptivity or responsiveness has been applied to tensegrity structures, has in this case, or in this case, has been applied to arches, has this case, to shell, has this case, very important, in Stuttgart, or to cantilever, or to stress or ribbon bridge. So it's to a very ra large range of structures. But a very interesting contribution has been done recently by the company called BERD, that patented a system called OPS, Organic Pre-Stressing System, to construct larger spans with a movable scaffolding system. So the actuator in this figure is located here. So, and depending on the amount of concrete, the actuator increase the pre-stress of the cable. So inspired by this very efficient technology, what we are trying to do now is move this idea to footbridge. So this is a very simple external post tension footbridge, similar to the footbridge that we saw 30 minutes ago. And basically our idea is to replace 
the strat with an actuator that works for specific value of the live load. This is very important. Um, we define what we call the live load threshold. That means that before achieving this value, the actuator doesn't work. The actuator works only if the live load threshold is exceeded. In the next example, this live load threshold is set as three kilonewton per square meter, but is, is an example. So where there is no load, the actuator slips and everything is okay. Then the first load appears, but this lower is one kilonewton per square meter, lower than our live load threshold. So nothing happens and the structure deform. The same with two kilonewton per square meter, but when we achieve three kilonewton per square meter, the actuator starts working and starting elongate. The same for four and the phone five. So as a summary, we have an actuator, we have, I will say, a partially responsive structures. That means that for uh, um, low value of the live load slips while for high value of the lie load, the actuator start running. Therefore, we have three main load conditions from the structural analysis point of view. The first one is that when only permanent loads act and post-tensioning fully compensate the permanent load at mid-span. Here we have bending moments and we have displacement. Here the displacement is zero for permanent loads. Then, the live load start act, but the value is lower than QT, this one, which is the live load threshold. So the structure, the form and behave as a standard, I would say a passive post-tension structure. The, therefore, bending here and displacement depend on the relative uh, stiffness between the deck and the post-tension system. But then when the live load exceeded QT, the, the actuator here starts working and the structure behaves again as a continuous beam with the support at the mid span. So uh, in order to obtain the depth of the main beam and the area of the post tension, we have to fulfill uh, several conditions. Basically, the post tension at ULS, the post tension at SLS, the beam at ULS, and the beam as SLS. It's important to say that this last criterion usually govern the design. Let's to see it in a more specific way. So in this case, the live load threshold has been set as two kilonewton per square meter. Before we used three, now we are using two, and the deformation of the structure is scaled 200 times. So now there is live load of one, the, the, the actuator doesn't work, and this point that was here has the form here. Then we have two, and this point here, uh, starting from this moment, should not move horizontally. So we increase, increase, increase. So this is the evolution of the deformed shape under increasing live loads and the maximum value of the, of the vertical displacement is not a mid span here, but is a lo located in another point somewhere here. So in addition to the previous design criteria, we consider a possible accidental situation of uh, actuator shutdown, but being an accidental situation until now, we have discovered that it never uh, govern the design. So as uh, we have seen before, we adopted various values of QT, the live load threshold, but this is a variable of the problem. So in order to cover all the the range of partially responsive post tension structure from full responsive to standard structure, passive structure, we define the degree of responsiveness as the ratio between the trash live load, QT, divided by the, 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 the design load. That means the maximum expected live load according to the code. That means basically that 
if this ratio Qt divided by Qd is zero, we have a fully responsive structure. That means that the actuator works for any live load. While if you have this, this value is equal to one, we have a passive standard post tensioning system. So this plot shows the degree of responsiveness has horizontal axis. Again, this is a passive structure here. This is a fully active structure that works for any live load versus the span to depth ratio. So for example, for, <clears throat> uh, for a standard post tension structure, we can see that the slenderness that we achieve is almost 28, maybe some 30. But if we have, for example, a QT divided by QT of 0.15, we have a slender of uh, almost 60. That means that the depth of the, the main beam is one half of the reference structure, reference passive structure. The second plot shows the degree of responsiveness again here versus the maximum displacement here. And here we can see that for almost all cases, the vertical displacement here is almost has almost the value of the limit according to the code. So that confirm that SLS govern the design. And in addition, please note that the displacement at the mid span, which is the blue one, is always lower than the maximum displacement in the beam. And therefore, the maximum displacement is confirmed that is always located in another point. So right now we are studying uh, the total cost of the whole lifetime of the structure, considering embodied and operational energy. In fact, our goal is to define the live load threshold in order to obtain an optimal responsive structure, consider 50 years of life of the footbridge. And the plot here shows again the, the degree of responsiveness versus the relative cost. And this cost is interesting because it's not only the beam, it's the beam plus the post tension plus the actuators plus the energy that we need to use this actuator during 50 years. So for example, this is the reference. And in this case, we can see that we can save almost 10%, but accounted has the total cost of the structure plus maintaining. And here we had the same analysis, but in terms of carbon footprint. And here we can save again, okay, that we can save almost 30% compared to the reference structures. This is a, these are very preliminary structure. We are just working this week on that. And we hope to improve a little bit these, these results. So this, this research has a very technological uh, component. So right now we are working on selecting actuators, sensors, and developing the control. And I know this is a very simplified and stupid, <laughs> it's a very small prototype that we built some months ago, wh where you can see a liner actuator here, and this rope represent uh, the post tensioning, I, perfect, I know perfectly that is a simplification. And here we have an Arduino with a sensor to measure the distance. But it was the first idea to test, uh, to test, um, it's a, it was the first attempt to test our idea. So here we have a short video. And here the threshold is, is expressed in terms of displacement and it is set as 15 millimeter. That means that if the displacement is lower than 15 millimeters, the actuator doesn't work. So now first apply the first load, a little bit more load and almost nothing ap applied. But then when we applied more load, the actuator start working, maintaining the maximum displacement fix. And then when we removed the loads, 
the actuators goes back to zero. So the prototype was a so big simplification of the problem. So what we are doing right now is to build a six meter uh, span prototype with real embedded sensor with good uh, actuators and a good control. But these are the, the main dimension that we are using for, uh, for the structure. Uh, and again, we are going to show this, I hope we are going to show this, our desire is to show this prototype for the Footbridge Congress in Madrid next year. And uh, I think this is another good reason to attend the symposium and uh, visit the city. Thank you very much for the attention and thanks again for, uh, for, for the invitation. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for this very, very interesting presentation. And I think also from the audience, uh, I expect a lot of questions because this topic is super new and also, I mean, we are talking a lot about conceptual design and optimization of the design material. So this is a really hot topic. So thank you very much. Um, while waiting, maybe I can ask some question uh, from the audience. So I mean, while waiting for the audience, um, I can ask some curiosity. So I, I already seen some part of these results because uh, Leonardo gave for us uh, as, um, during the symposium that we have last year in Parma. Uh, organized by the young members group in Italy, Leonardo was invited as keynote and presented some of some of these, uh, these results. Uh, so um, the question, uh, I mean, uh, you talked a lot of so many stuff, but maybe we can start from this, uh, this last one. Uh, do you see any kind of limitation of this kind of application? I don't know about maybe the span of the bridge or there's some kind of geometry or limitation about this. Yes. This is a nice yeah, question. A curiosity. <laughs> no, it's a nice question. Okay. Well, um, probably it depends on the type of actuators. So we believe that you can find actuators with, that can carry any kind of load, but probably the economic cost of actuator too much big for spans of more than, I would say, 40 meters, but I'm not sure about that, probably is too much expensive. So I think it's not competitive. And I have to say that we, just a few weeks ago, we started an agreement with Festo, which is a, a very big company in Germany about actuator controls, etc. Because from the structural point of view, we, we know uh, enough to control this kind of stacks, tr uh, stuffs, but from from the automation, robotics, control, etc., I personally have no knowledge about that. So we need to create a team with people that know about this topic. With regards to the sensor, I think that now we have a lot of sensor. We are evaluating a different kind of sensor. This is totally a new word for me, but we are looking for sensors that are not which result do not depend on the temperature, not depend on the sun, on the wind, et cetera, et cetera. So our desire was to, is to put some embedded sensor in the deck, but it's not easy because you, you need to have an external point of reference for measurements. So the real application is complicated, but I think it's possible. So my desire, this is a dream, is to trust this for a six meter prototype and then jump to, I don't know, 15, 20 millimeters, but for real structures with the real footbridge, uh, I mean, a real footbridge with the real live load, et cetera, et cetera. And it's another topic of interest, I think, is that the fact that the live load can move everywhere with a velocity, the a speed that you don't know, and the the magnitude of the load, mm -hmm. the live load is not known. So you have to say, to, you have to face all these different problems. Okay, thank you. While we have some uh, very nice comments in the chat, very um, interesting presentation, congratulations. And also we have a question in the q and form. So good afternoon from Miguel Meyado Guerra. Uh, good afternoon, regards for the great presentation. May I ask you about um, dynamic effects? If the dynamic effects have been studied uh, for these kind of structures? 
uh, I guess, uh, okay, thank you very much for the, the question. I, I guess he's referring to the last, uh, to the last part. I, 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 because it's the more slender, I guess, I'm not sure. But in this case, yes, we are doing some uh, simplified uh, dynamic analysis. And it's nice to see that, for example, that, I mean, the depth of the system is not the depth of the beam, is the depth of the wall system. So the, the stiffness of the structure is not so low. But fortunately, we, we share uh, in our lab, we share our lab with some dynamic people, expert of dynamics. So we ask them some help and we did our analysis and uh, it worked. Okay, so thank you. I think we can close out this question. And um, okay, another comment in the chat. Excellent presentation, very interesting. Okay, and just to talk while we wait for eventual other question, uh, what do you think is the major link? I mean, um, the possible limitation of this technique and the application of this technique in the near future, uh, in general, the post tensioning of structure, why this system is not often adopted, and which can be uh, our effort to put this uh, um, technique, uh, structural uh, solution more. Uh, use it in practice? Well, this is another complicated uh, question because, for example, if we see the, if we see the first application, I mean the Mesory footbridge, this is not complicated. I mean, the second one, my PhD thesis, yes, I will say that is, is something more refined somehow, but the first one, why not? There are just blocks of stone and they are super cheap. And from the uh, material, from the CO2 point of view, from the ecological point of view, you don't need any uh, chemical process. And the durability is infinite because you are not using reinforcement. So in this case too, I, I see an, a, 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 a closer, uh, I guess, a real application in the near future. Why not? A very just imagine, for example, in a park, instead of using a concrete structure or a steel structure, use an arch made of stones. I think is is wonderful, and and the durability is, is huge. So, I want to work more a lot uh, on these three different topics, and we are working on other topics related to pre-stress too. So I, th I believe that in the future, we will have more post tension structure. This is my, my idea. And for example, if we refer to the first part of the talk, to the masonry, if we delete the word masonry and we use um, ultra high performance concrete, but the concept is absolutely the same. I mean, we can replace the masonry with very good material has, for example, ultra high performance concrete. But if we don't have any bars, any reinforcement, passive <clears throat> reinforcement, I mean, we can have very slender structures and the durability is very high. Okay, thank you. I think we have a question from the FAB president, Torole Olsen. Do you want to? Thank you very much, Leonardo. Uh, I, I really enjoyed this very much. Uh, both of you managed to show how uh, structures behave and you also showed how you can influence uh, the behavior I, I i thought it was very nice and uh, okay. i know you have had many webinars and uh, i i mentioned helga and her wine <laughs> bowl and i perfectly well know that it's a lot more to to the ymg than wine bowls and this confirms this so thank you very much Thank you very much for your, your nice comment. Thank you. And I think also David has a question from the speaker. Yes, I have a, a question. As a matter of fact, I have a couple. Uh, you showed us a, a very interesting launching girder to, with active uh, post-tensioning. And I think this is a very good idea. What do you think on using this idea for incrementally launched bridges that they normally you have to design with a lot of pre-stressing because of the negative bending moments on the launching. And uh, with this idea, maybe you could save a lot of uh, post-tensioning on, on that. 
I have to say that I never thought about that. <laughs> so thank you very much for the idea. <laughs> um, it's, I didn't think about that. But yeah, I, I know perfectly the problem. And because we are doing some master thesis about that just during this month. So I, I didn't think about it. Because I know okay. that there are some trials, some, for example, to do some um, uh, cable state bridge where using in, instead of cable in the middle cable, you put an actuator. But this didn't work very well. But what you propose specifically, specifically for cons big construction maybe for, can be very interesting because among all the responsive structure that we've seen before, the only one we can say that, that had a lot of Sussex is the OPS. And this is because I think because one, because the idea is very clever. And second, because you have a perfect control of the live load because the concrete that we are pouring is control. That means that you can pre-stress the, the cable as you want. You can control perfectly the live load. But what you, what, what you propose, I think is in, very interesting and I will think a little bit more about that. Okay. <laughs> and I have another, another proposal for you to, to work more. <laughs> uh, you, Thank you. You can, you can use this for uh, as active dampers for seismic action in special structures? Uh, yes. There are several people in Japan that are working on this topic. It's not my topic and I don't know uh, a lot about that. I know that uh, a lot of people are using uh, active members, I would say, to reduce, the, to increase the damping and so on. But I, I never studied um, a little bit the state of the art of this kind of elements. I know that there are many people working on that, but I don't have any knowledge. Okay. Well, I think from, from my point of, from my side, it's, uh, it's very good. Very congratulations for a very interesting presentation. Thank and you keep, very much. Keep it up. <laughs> okay, I will do it. We have another question meanwhile in the, in the Q&A form. And the first one is an, by an uh, anonymous uh, attendee, um, and it's uh, about the um, use of post tension in seismic zone, which is the behavior of this kind of structure in seismic zone. I don't know. Well, I have to say, I will be back. Uh, I will move a little bit the presentation. I will do it mm -hmm. quickly. Well, meantime, I will answer, but I want to say that uh, I think that the post tension is very interesting for seismic zone because you can increase the stiffness of the structure without adding mass. So you know that oh, everybody knows that the seismic action is related to the mass, et cetera. But post tension has no weight. I would say it's the weight of the cable, but it's nothing compared to the structure. And in this case, I will show one second. This is a very nice, is, this one is a very high seismic zone is close to Foggia, that is in southern east of, uh, of Italy. It's a very high seismic zone. And the decision of using post tension allowed to maintain a very, I would say, slender and with low depth structure, but achieving, a, 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 a achieving an increase in stiffness. So I think this is a very, very interesting. The next question is uh, always about Miguel Mellado um, Guetta, uh, talking about the behavior of the structure after construction. How the structure will behave under accidental scenarios as fire of a break of the tensors? Are there any protection or no protection for the cables? Yeah, uh, we face this problem. I think this is uh, this is a problem not for the, this first kind of structure because the pre-stress is internal, but for the second one. And our idea, mm -hmm. so we have to answer. For the adaptive structure, what we are doing is that if, for example, the actuator doesn't, doesn't work for any reason, a shutdown of the power of people that I don't know, the structure does not collapse. So this is one of the requirements that we are asking to the structures. And respect to the second part of the talk, my idea is that you don't have one cable. 
you have a series of cable, like in cable state bridges. So you can share the loads among the different cables. So the idea is that if one cable breaks, you can divide, you can split the cable, the, the load in, in the other cables. Okay, yeah, is it, is it, but it's, in, it's a very important topic about redundant, redundancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And now another question from Florian Dempster. How can work in the same time with demand, value, post tension with actuator? Uh, Marta, can you repeat the question, please? Uh, I'm not sure either about the question. Uh, you can read it in the Q&A form at the bottom of the screen, but the question is how can work in the same time with demand value post tension with actuator. I don't know, maybe I, I, I would have to the attendees to rewrite the question because it's not clear for me and I think also for Leonardo. Maybe if you can uh, write again, Florian, please. And meanwhile, move to the next uh, question from Andrea Franchini. Andrea Franchini from UCL. Ciao, Andrea. Thank you very much for the insightful uh, presentation. You showed us some videos in which the structure fails if the cable is cut. From the point of view of structural safety, okay, how is the robustness of the post tension uh, structure? Could be this limitation? We partially answered to this question. I don't know if you yeah. want to add something. Yeah, no, again, I will say the same. It's like the okay. same of a cable strike structure, a cable stay bridge. Just just to divide the, the, the load in different cables. So if one fails, you can split the, the load on the other. Yeah, but it's, it's very important. I, I know, I know. And it is more important in the third topic. But this is very important, I have to say, that if the structure, if the actuator doesn't work, there is no problem to, to the structure. It will deform, but it will not collapse. Yeah, this is a very important okay. criterion. Perfect. And last question, which type of cable, I mean unbonded or bonded, do you recommend for the structure that you've shown? Uh, well, this I think that this question applied to the first one, and I will say unbonded. This is because then you can remove the cable, you can change the cable, in, include you can reuse the stones. Imagine that you have a cable of a cable, so and you have to substitute one after a few years. Well, you can remove one without any scaffolding because you have the other. And then you put the one cable and then you change the other. So if it is bonded, you cannot do that. So I will say bond, unbonded. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we can also stop here because uh, uh, we don't have any other information about Florian. Uh, so I, I don't know, uh, I would say we can close it. Okay, thank you very much, Leonardo, for this presentation, for being here with us today, chatting and answering to all our curiosities about your work. And we will find the video of this uh, presentation soon on YouTube, I guess, in. Um, a couple of weeks uh, so if you want to share it with your colleagues and also from the audience we have some other question in wise um okay now just thanks from um from the audience really interesting topics okay, okay. Marta, thank you very so, much for the invitation Martin. thank you very much for the invitation thank you and thank you to the FIB for this opportunity that is giving us to have a voice and talk about our uh, research topics. We are young, but we have, have several things to say. So thank you again uh, for the uh, FIB Young, Web, uh, Young Members Webinar Series. And have a good evening and hope to see you soon. In <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Stay safe. Yeah. Goodbye. Ciao. Thank Ciao. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.